Okay, folks, I have the great pleasure of introducing somebody very special to you. This individual has won Emmy Award, he's an Emmy Award winning TV journalist who has worked for the US Network, NBC News, for 26 years. That career took him to Asia since the early 1880s. There he learned firsthand the extraordinary, pardon me? I said not quite that long, 1980s. Okay. What did I say? 1880. <laughs> okay, I said we had a very special person here. Now you know why. Now you really know why this person is so special. And he looks great for his age. Okay, let's suffice to say this is an incredibly experienced journalist who has had global experience for many years. However, he's here tonight to talk to us about his relationship with Huntington and how Huntington has changed. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you someone who first started down this pathway and passage of talking to folks about Huntington at our PEI conference in 2008. How incredible is that? So this is another adopted Canadian that I'm introducing you to. I'd like you all to please warmly welcome Charles Sabine. One hundred and forty-five years old. That's incredible. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, and that's an amazing introduction. Um, are we having a uh, good conference? Yeah. Yeah. That was now. I'm going to ask that question again because that sounded like um, like a, a, a bowls club in the back end of England somewhere. <laughs> that didn't sound Canadian at all. So, are we having a good conference? <laughs> okay. Right now, first we have to deal with dress. My dress. Do you like this? You like the little. <laughs> Okay, because I haven't got a choice here, right? You can do the jacket. I, so I can, you can't hear me? God. Sorry. Okay. Excuse me. I'll speak up. You can have the uh, jacket, or you can have no jacket. No jacket. No jacket. No jacket. No jacket. Is, uh, anyone, uh, anyone for the jacket at all? No. Take it off. Take it off. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. As Bev said, I uh, came to speak at this conference once before. Uh, 2008. It was Prince Edward Island. Who was there? Put your hand up. What? Uh, maybe like. Less than a quarter, maybe. Well, that's great. That's terrific because that means that all the rest of you are new to this, at least in the last six years, which is um, terrific. And that's kind of something I'm going to be talking about here. But what I want to tell you is that on that day, and I have that actual talk that I gave that day, this is the actual script that I have, dusted it down. Um, on that day, I uh, laid out what I thought then we needed to have happen in the Huntington's disease community here in Canada and all around the world. And so what I thought I'd do today is to uh, look back at that, what those <laughs> things that I said we needed to do, and see just how far we've progressed. Kind of like a, a report card, I suppose you might say. So what did I do uh, back in 2008? Well, I uh, started by... <laughs> I can make this move. Oh, I know. You know what? I think I've got to be closer. Yeah. Yeah. Many Palestinians here fear that the I started by telling how uh, it has worked for half my life for NBC News and places, and news and places like this a poor taste of the Gaza, and, and of course in uh, Baghdad, which is a place where you're frequently re reminded that good health can never be taken for granted. <laughs> Now, I would love, by the way, to suggest that the um, things in that region have improved in those, in those six years, but 
as you will see in the next hour, they're de depressingly familiar. I have to say that the report card for the rest of the world in not learning lessons from mistakes of the past is about a D minus. Um, but that is the rest of the world. That is not the Huntington's world, which I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so back to the fragility of health. Uh, I said in, back in 2008 that uh, my personal reminder of that came in 1994 with news of my father. Uh, he was suffering from Huntington's disease, a condition I, like most people, had never heard of. And uh, how my mother insisted on nursing him personally until his death, because no one really inspired any faith in her that uh, they knew how to do it. There were no standards of care to follow. <coughs> Just horror stories of my father. Come on. I, mean, I was talking about my dad there with my mum and uh, the fact that she uh, insisted on nursing him personally until his death. And the significant point about that, as it's become apparent later, was that there were no standards of care then uh, for her to follow back then in the UK. We needed Jimmy Pollard in it. He was alive and around, he wasn't there with my, for my mother, unfortunately. Um, of course, you know, the fact is that there, were, there was very little that could be worse, you would think, than my father's faith, the uh, loss of dignity that comes from a, from a once proud man to watch family and friends wince as his body and mind became twisted until they were unrecognizable. But far worse than any of that, of course, the knowledge that he could pass the nightmare on to his sons. I uh, spoke also in PEI about my brother, John, five years older than me, how he studied law at Oxford. Well, I can update you um, on John. Uh, he now has, oh yeah, there we go. He now has uh, to have carers uh, wash and shave him. But another personal discovery since 2008, which I didn't mention then, which was that it turned out that my family did know about the disease before 1994. They just didn't tell John and I about it. And that knowledge was lost because of the stigma that makes the history of almost every HD family a mire of hidden truths. I had an uncle whose diagnosis was hidden for more than a decade from John and I. So what was the world like uh, six years ago for John and I and all of those who were facing HD? And uh, to try and illustrate that, I'm going to introduce you to this sophisticated image. That is basically a uh, blank screen with a line of black down the side. And the idea of this is that the whole screen represents the population of the world in 2008. And the black line represents people with HD. And the sound that accompanies this, that, is this. A chord in the key of B minor. Regarded by musical types as the key of passive suffering, an expression of quiet acceptance of fate. And this is the combination that summed up the landscape I looked out on in 2008. Nothing other than desolation to report from the hideous world of HD. No hope, no dignity, no part of humanity. Families suffering from shame, stigma, ignorance, misdiagnosis, misunderstanding. And no way of moving out of that black line. The separation between black and white was very stark. Now, a couple of years before that talk in p and I, I discovered that the disease that uh, took my father and is inflicting on my brother the same terrible decline in his prime will take me too. The neurologist who gave me the results of my test said, there's nothing you can do about this disease, so just live your life as well as you can. So not an hour went by when I didn't picture how my 
quality of life would drain away. And fear that however much my friends would say that they would always want to come and see me, that they wouldn't really want to. Just like I didn't really want to go and see my father once he had lost the ability to converse with me. And would I be able to dance with my daughter, born that very year, in P I, when I was in PI, um, on would I be able to dance with her on her 21st birthday? That time bomb was real, present, and desperate for all of us who knew that we had this disease. Every day, men, women, and children slipped into the cauldron of despair, which was that point where there was no longer the hope that the research of scientists might bear fruit in time for them. But is the future as black and white for the next generation? I have several reasons to think we have a chance to say not, and those reasons will give a score to our report card. Just before that PEI conference, I swapped war zones for the battlefield countering the prejudice and stigma surrounding HD in an effort to help the sufferers and their families to find the strength to face up to this disease. That experience brought me into contact with people right across the world in every imaginable sphere of HD. Researchers, clinicians, students, patients, families, carers, pharmaceutical companies, politicians, and charities. And I learned a great deal. In fact, I learned so much that while that neurologist who gave me my test results told me that there was nothing I could do about the disease, the reality is that there's everything I can do about the disease. The problem is finding the time to do it all. So what has changed in that landscape? Well, back then, I'll read from it here, I said, I can tell Prince Edward Island, Huntingdon's depressing fatalism is compounded by a self-imposed stigma that has made victims ashamed to stand up and be counted as people who need the support of the community and the state. But there's no point in Huntington's families complaining about the existence of prejudice any more than there is about the randomness of genetic mutations. It's a fact of life. So we should not waste time and energy moaning. We need to do something about it. We must employ what means we can to legislate, or even better, educate against that prejudice in the future. Well, Senator Ted Kennedy's last act of legislation, which he called the first US Human Rights Act of the 21st century, addressed constitutional rights for HD families over there across the border in the USA, the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, otherwise known as GINA. And we have found ways, we have found ways around the world to come out of those shadows of shame and misrepresentation around HD. The uh, all-party parliamentary group at Huntington's Disease set up uh, in the UK, in London, two years after PEI, it gave a great boost there to the morale of HD families, uh, enabling a pursuit of dignity. But these images mark, and even more than that, cutting through that black line and adding, adding a melody to the key, allowing future generations not to have to hide their shame about those they mourn, and indeed not to have to hide themselves even more. No longer a lost, unrepresented community. If the stark black line can be broken just a little, perhaps there are ways to feel that life is not so black and white. Okay, page seven of my talk in PEI. I said, we need more contact between the scientists and the people whose lives can depend on their work. So that, that can allow the patients to feel more connected to the work in the laboratories. Right. Whoop. That, that wasn't so 
supposed to happen? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to, we're supposed to see. So, uh, why would that do? Thank you, young person. All right, go off. All right, hold on. There we are. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, someone having an MRI scan, um, brain scan. Me, actually. Um, I and 200 other volunteers around the world have been part of a, uh, a project called Track HD, which was just started around that time of the PEI conference. And it was a trial conducted over seven years now, which those of us falling into the symptomatic state of HD can have various aspects of our lives which can be indicated biomarkers, as they're called, measured. Um, and one of the study sites was here in Canada, in, uh, in Vancouver. Oh, there's nothing more worthwhile, honestly, than finding treatments for my disease. And it appears that most of the other volunteers felt the same. The uh, dropout rate was less than 7%. That is, 93% of us stayed through seven years of this with nothing other than helping people in the future as a motive. The, the uh, collaboration that is necessary to speed up the process of drug discovery involves the participation of people like me just as much as it does the researchers. Trust, you see. Trust. And that comes from communication. We now have unprecedented access to information about research and care for those with HD, with websites like HD Buzz. <coughs> now you might think, of course, HD, relatively rare disease. The science around it's highly technical. There's been no single treatment of, or method of slowing the degree of disease progression so far. So there certainly aren't going to be many lay people who would be interested in a website devoted to HD research, right? Well, in its first 36 months where we are now, HD Buzz has published 179 articles, now has more than 100,000 hits per month, 6,000 social media followers, and is translated into 13 languages. I can assure you that other people who work in other communication of other diseases look at HD Buzz <coughs> and unanimously say that there is nothing else like it in, in, in scientific research. <laughs> we also have, of course, a site for young people concerned with HD, HD Yo. Um, Marvellous that it is. Also, I understand that it reached its one millionth hit quite recently, last month, I'm told. So, congratulations. <laughs> this this uh, summer, we saw the D Day 70th anniversary commemorations in Normandy, represented, of course, by so many uh, Canadian families of those people who bravely died uh, on the beaches there in Normandy, reminding us that it's only one. A long lifetime since the Nazis were defeated. And I want to show you just how the image of HD has changed during that same period. This 1938 poster, a splendid piece of propaganda for the Nazi compulsory euthanasia program, shows a doctor with a man with Huntington's disease and the words, this person suffering from hereditary defects, I'm translating from the ancient German script there, this is a person suffering from hereditary defects cost the community 60,000 Reichmarks during his right lifetime. Fellow Germans, that is your money too. So, keep that image in mind while I juxtapose it with this projection of the disease from last year. Hi there, would you like to know about HD? These young people, all from HD families all around the world, illustrate vividly the success and the opportunity of this pivotal moment in the history of communications. Riding yet another wave 
in the confluence of environmental factors in our favour, social networks. HDEO and uh, HD um, and, and YPAD uh, here in Canada, um, extraordinary successes. How many people would have been actively involved in organisations related to dementia even 20 years ago, even maybe six years ago? Think of the difference, extraordinary. New media is the canvas in which collaboration can be painted. It's the greatest gift we could have ever asked for, not just Facebook and Twitter, but videos and short films. I know of at least six documentaries that are in production or post-production worldwide about Huntington's disease right now. And of course, all of these factors work both ways, because uh, not just bringing people together, but collating expertise. Remember that established standard of care that was so missing when my father was alive? It has begun already. So, a big question. Are we ready for drugs that, have, uh, that might be around the corner? Another change since 2008 for me is that my daughter, Breezy, who you saw a little while ago, who was born that year, now goes to school. There's a raised common near where I drop her off in the mornings. And uh, from there you can see in the far distance the River Severn and the hills of Wales beyond. But much closer though, about five miles away, you can see this mound here. That's a place called Downham Hill. In the summer of 1796, even I wasn't alive then. <laughs> In the summer of 1796, there was a cow that grazed on Downham Hill called Blossom. Now Blossom, like many cows at the time, developed the firm fairly harmless cowpox, which she passed on to her milkmaid, a young, a young woman who was called Sarah Names. Now Blossom was a Gloucester cow, like that one up on the top there, a particularly fine species. Uh, that inhabits the Cotswolds, and the ailment that Blossom passed on to Sarah was of great interest to a local physician, this chap here, called Edward Jenner, whose practice encompassed the village where I live now. Jenner had asked in the inns around that anyone hearing of a human case of cowpox should inform him immediately, because he had a theory. He wanted to know if the local country legend that those who had suffered cowpox might be immune to smallpox could hold the solution to what was the biggest killer in the world right then. At that time, one in seven deaths around the world were caused by smallpox. So Jenna took Sarah to this house, his house, in the village of Barclay, where he took samples of infection from her body. He then got his gardener's son, eight-year-old, called James Phipps, and infected him with that cowpox. After, it gets better. And after James recovered, he deliberately infected him with smallpox. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> he did not get sick. The boy had received the world's first vaccination, so called, of course, after the Latin for cow, vacca. Soon, Jenna was giving vaccinations free to the poor from my village and others in, from this grand looking building. And before long, people were being vaccinated all over the world. Napoleon vaccinated his whole army. And US President Thomas Jefferson vaccinated his household. Jenna had discovered the way to protect against a disease that was going to kill 300 million people in the 20th century alone. And thanks to vaccination, 200 years after his discovery, the World Health Organization declared smallpox now eradicated. The only disease to have been wiped off the face of the earth. You see, not a famous scientist from London like Newton and Darwin, but a country doctor with an inquiring mind using nothing, nothing more than his powers of observation. 
the man responsible for saving the lives of more than any human in history. And his simple philosophy that he had was, don't think, try, try. And that is what the research community in HD is doing, in combination with all of us, trying. And it's doing this with an increasingly engaged patient community. Treatments for <coughs> diseases like smallpox and HD don't just drop onto our laps. They take work, courage, commitment, and interaction. That interaction I said that we needed back in Prince Edward Island in 2008 is happening. And so has another goal that I set out for us in 2008, and I read again. So I was talking about my NBC experiences and what I learned from them, and I said, one thing I've learned about hope is that it comes most often as a product of working together. Well, since 2008, family organizations like this one have developed from a shoulder to cry on to important tools to encourage families proactively to engage in research. The uh, collaborations have merged from tiny groups in local communities to national organizations and so on to a global movement of families, support groups, and researchers melting bit by bit the fear of the disease by the power of information and integration. They may all be small steps, but together they develop a crucial momentum, both the cause and the <coughs> symptom of greater understanding of the disease's progression. And so the two parts merge further together Success of these organizations like, like in this room is exponential. As membership grows, more people are prepared to put their heads above the parapet. These forces of trust and collaboration empower communication. Communication leads to understanding. Understanding dilutes fear and thus more of that black line that separated us. And the vacuum left by fear can be filled with hope. And this will come quickest from global collaboration. Diseases don't recognize countries' borders, and nor should we. So what else did I say back in PEI? I spoke of the need, quote, to counter the fatalism that pervades HD. And I quoted Dr. Michael Hayden, who was a new sort of friend to me then, or a very good friend to all of you. I do what he, what Dr. Hayden described as genetic fundamentalism or a genes are us mentality. I said that that was what something that we had to counter. Well, this is a video postcard that I compiled from the CHDI Therapeutics Conference in Palm Springs earlier this year. I haven't got any sound on it here for obvious reasons, but if you want to watch it with the sound, you can go on to the uh, uh, HSC uh, website. You'll see it there. In this, I reported about uh, new research showing what HD patients can do right now, right now, to alter disease progression. New drug, new what they call non-drug-based therapies involving things like sleep and. Uh, diet and other environmental factors that we now know, the researchers now know, do make a difference. But of course, as well as that, we can register on enroll and be part of the future right now. These are things we can do right now to make a difference. Now, when I compiled these kinds of video postcards, where the first, you know, we've got now the first uh, possibility of real therapeutics for HD. The most common and significant reaction from families I get is astonishment that there are so many smart people giving up their lives to help us. And with that in mind, I say to them, yeah, you know, we have a big problem still. Sure, we do. 
but we can all become part of the solution. This paradigm shift in the relationship between the general population and all the agencies that provide health care is going to have to take place throughout society. If a family has a severe health issue that it has a particular reason to care about, and I'm talking about any, not just HD here, and show me a family that doesn't, by the way, they should not assume that health departments, politicians, or pharmaceutical companies are going to do everything that can be done on their behalf. And by the way, on the subject of talking about reactions to my talks. If you want to know what the really makes me most happy of all, when I get any res response to one of my talks, it's this. It's someone who says, you know what, we came to your talk um, from our family, we've got these cousins who, you know, have never wanted to go to anything like this, or engage, or talk about the H word, or blah, 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 these people, you know, we've all got them, um, who, uh, you know, just, don't want to confront it. And we talked about uh, some of the things that you said. And Joe, my cousin, he's going to look up on the internet and just see, you know, about it. That, that, when that happens, that is what gives me more pleasure than anything else. Okay, remember that. Remember our cousins. Okay, back in PEI. I said, HD societies and health groups must understand that cure HD is a fine goal, but implying that anything but a cure amounts to a failure is counterproductive because it places too great a burden on scientists. Okay, I think we're understanding that now, but I'm going to take that further. I want to banish the word that so dominated every reference of the disease when I made my first depressing research back in 1994 when I found out about my father. What was that word? Incurable. Mm -hmm. The first adjective used to describe the disease when I read about it in 1994. An incurable neurodegenerative disease. Not only a redundant word, but a completely counterproductive one. Almost nothing in medicine has been cured. Not cancer, not HIV, not influenza, not the common cold. What we have done is to learn to manage the symptoms those of those diseases. So to suggest that incurable is the most relative adjective to describe HD is tantamount to saying influenza is an incurable viral disease, or life is a fatal human condition. The, the word is utterly irrelevant, serving no purpose whatsoever other than to induce despair. The reality, trust me, is far more positive, because instead of waiting for a non-existent fairy to appear, we are already in a process of enacting what is effectively a cure. Finding ways to manage HD. Manage HD. And this really matters because faced with this dreadful word incurable, families like us simply wouldn't engage with the protagonists who are working on our behalf to find treatments. So what do I mean, by the way, when I talk about proactive involvement from families? Well, look at the staggering success in making HIV AIDS a manageable disease, not cured, managed. All because of the refusal of pressure groups to take no for an answer and let defeatism or red tape stand in their way. We all have to learn that we have to take responsibility for our own health. And I don't mean this in the sense of the current Republican-Democrat debate in the USA about paying for Obamacare. This is not about taxation, this is about constitutional enrichment. This paradigm shift in the relationship between the general population and all the agencies that provide health care is going to have to take place through all of society. <coughs> they should not afraid 
of letting them to be a let of letting themselves be heard. None of us should. The HIV AIDS lobby wasn't, and look how successful it was. You live in a great and wonderful democracy here in Canada. Use it. In 2008, I called for us to bring the attention uh, to not just the big pharma, but those outside the HD world by communicating the importance of preemptive medicine. Preemptive meaning what we in the HD world and its genetic, unique genetic nature can have above everyone else. What I said, the first, this is my quote from there, I said, the first thing we must do is communicate to the rest of the world why anyone not in a Huntington's family should care about HD. Well, I was just in Barcelona last week for the European Huntington's disease meetings, meeting there. Hundreds of representatives of the big pharmaceutical companies there. Hundreds. Okay. Back in 2008, the year of the PEI, the EHDN meeting there was in Lisbon. I was there. Want to know how many big pharma representatives there were there back in 2008? No. Zero. Not one. Zip. Nada. Okay. This year, there were almost as many pharma representatives. I mean, big pharma. Not, you know, not just small biotech companies. I'm talking about GSK, Pfizer, Teva. These guys, there were almost as many of those as there were family members. And if anything this is, illustrates the change that has happened in our lot over the last six years, it's that fact. So what, what went on in, what went on there in, in uh, Barcelona? Well, I know that Jeff and Ed um, told you about the fantastic stuff, news out of there, so I won't go into it more, but just to recap, five clinical trials uh, starting over the next, in the next 12 months involving 1,600 patients. Um, one of them, the first drug aimed at so-called gene silencing, in which the actual genetic process that is the root cause of HD could be disrupted. And that was what we were talking about when we talked about preemptive medicine. That's what that is, stopping it before in its tracks, before it even needs to be treated. This is going to be the future, and we are the vanguard of the future. There was also a, another one, which is a Teva drug, which is going into a proper clinical trial <coughs> um, called Prodopity. My brother John has uh, been on the open label of that. I can't tell you what that has done for him and his family, the value that that's had given to his life and theirs, for him to be on that drug, which does only help symptoms, but it helps. Something is better than nothing. As I said, in, yeah. back in Prince Edward Island, no one should underestimate what research means to the families around the world who suffer from untreatable diseases as we scour the media for any fragment of news from laboratories. In a world of total darkness, the very faintest of glimmer of light emboldens the human spirit to go on. So, I also talked then about how afraid I was of the future. I said, I'm absolutely terrified. And like me, families represent a community hidden by our own shame and made transparent by a vacuum of self-esteem. Well, do I think that now? No, I don't. Because we have moved from being the basket case of healthcare to the benchmark, the title of my talk. Now, I'm sure, I don't know how many of you read titles of talks and these things, or if you just kind of go, whatever. Uh, but if you, anyone who did read that might have been quite justified in thinking, what a crock, you know? <laughs> but benchmark of healthcare, come on. Like, you know, like this guy's selling us toothpaste or real estate or something. Excuse me, is there anyone in the audience who sells toothpaste or real estate? <laughs> <laughs> a 
economy. They're very fine, very fine occupations. But you know what I'm saying, right? You know, it seems like a bit of a sort of brave call, the title of my talk. Well, I did not choose those words just to pull in a crowd, you know? Um, I believe them. And they're, they're also the t it's also the title of talks when I give them to big pharmaceutical companies, these big companies that are getting interested. It's the same one. And the reason I can say it confidently is that I told them um, the reality. Now, the basket case bit, well, of course, we all know that, yes, it was a basket case for sure of healthcare, Huntington's disease, you know, not that long ago. But the benchmark, wow, how is that? Well, with what's going on, the advances that are going on right now in the laboratories, and with the potential of the greatest registry of any disease across the world, if we talk to our cousins, remember, with the biomarkers of unprecedented detail in pre-manifest patients, the unique gene genetic nature of our disease allows us to do that. No other disease can do that. I can assure you that other disease research groups are looking at us with envy, green with envy. And if you add to that the exponential rise in the globalization of communication and collaboration, which is unique to HD. It is unique. There is nowhere else where there is collaboration like there is amongst the researchers, as in HD. And you have what will be the template for the future of any area of medicine. And why do I think that is going to happen? The most crucial reason why is, well, the people. The escalation in 25 years of watching men kill each other has taught me another truth about them. That human beings lose their moral compass, their social equilibrium, if you like, when you take two things away from them. Dignity and hope. Now I think we've already shown the loss of dignity that those people suffering from HD feel. Huntington's has had the almost unique power to challenge the human spirit because of its terrible para paradoxical mix of finality and perpetuity. Finality for its individual victims, like my father, and perpetuity for the misery that it imparts on a family, like his sons. But the greatest evil has been the way it sucks in hope into a vortex. But it's never defeated that human spirit because the very best of humanity surrounds it. I've seen those qualities in the people that I've come into contact with around the world who are part of this battle. It's why I'm standing here now. The superhuman patience and tirelessness of the families and the other carers, the families in this room, and the professional clinicians like Jimmy Pollard and other extraordinary people who care for people with our disease, and the extraordinary devotion from the scientists and researchers like Mark Gutman and Michael Hayden, that surpasses all, our, all logic. You see, it's within our reach to change what is perceived as unchangeable, because the human spirit is capable of anything. And to prove that, I'm going to repeat a story from PEI, unashamedly, word for word. In 1991, I went to, no. Oh, it's okay. In 1991, after the Gulf War that did not remove Saddam, I went to the Iranian border with Iraq after Rumours that Kurdish refugees were spilling across it. Here we are, you see. Horribly similar. Identical situation to now. Same mountains, just the uh, children now of these poor people. Same thing happening. What we found was a sea of humanity falling over the mountains. A million people, mostly women and children, running from Saddam's bit the chemical attacks. It was winter, bitterly cold. And the image of Christopher until the day I die on my mind is one particular girl of about 12. She was clambering over those rocks, focused on survival, her face dripping with freezing mud. On her back, her younger sister, two or three years old, unconscious, barely alive. 
She had carried that child almost 90 miles. All humans are capable of far more than you would ever believe. So as the orchestra joins the chord in B minor, I will leave you with images of some people who bravely face their future with HD and some others who are simply frightened like I am. But all of us can dare to hope because our report card showed us we are winning. We are becoming one global family whose joint destiny is collectively in our hands as long as we grasp this moment. We are turning this around. We are the custodians of our voyage. Thank you. community and aren't we lucky we're you're all heroes and thank you Charles so much for having the courage to tell your story in such a beautiful way and connect back when the story started and show us the progression and really really reinforce the substantive hope and where we were and where we've come in such a short time but thank you for doing that so beautifully